The whole history of Waymart r revolves around the Delaware and Hudson Gravity Railroad and then eventually the Steam Railroad. And I see on the wall back there you have under the mitigation for the federal prison, uh, it shows a map there. So when you get up, be sure to look at that map and see where Waymart is if you're not sure. And uh, the most important thing was a pond and the first settler was Asa Stanton. And on that map, you'll see Stanton Pond. Well, after the DNH dammed it up, plus at least 12 other places, then it became a Lake Lador. And I, I was talking to these nice ladies here. I hope all of you have had a chance to go to our senior expo at Lake Lador. But anyway, the story is going to be today about how this had a great influence, especially on the mines and the development of the AFL-CIO which a lot of people didn't realize. So just to uh, interest you, there are some artifacts here and souvenirs from the park if you want to look at them while you get up to. And there's a wonderful article here, uh, which I'm going to refer to about when John Mitchell was at Lake Lador. So that's an overview of the park. Yes? When is that senior exhibition at Lake Lador? It's always in October, but I don't know what the date of it is. 29th. 29th is it? And if you haven't gone there, the, they have a two and a half million dollar art center and they have probably 50, don't you think, at least 50 exhibitors in there. And then you can walk over for three dollars, you can have lunch and you can ha and you'll see in my presentation the carousel building that was built by 1900. It was a fantastic building and for three dollars you can have lunch there too. Plus Sometimes they have the riding on the lake, too. So Stanton Pond, if you look at the map back there, became Lake Lador. Anyway, uh, it was a transition period. The DNH realized that the Gravity Railroad was soon going to be a thing of the past. In fact, they realized it by uh, 1880. And so it was a transition period. They knew they were going to have to change the steam. But the biggest problem, of course, is always the Moosic Mountain, Farview Mountain. What were they going to do? Because the steam engines could not go down the mountain by themselves. Because they could not go on the old um, gravity for the simple reason that the, the grade was much too steep. And the engines were weighed terrific about them. A, a couple tons or more. And the track wouldn't hold them. Right, and the track wouldn't hold them. So what they did is they widened the gravity from Carmondale to Shepherd's Crook and across to the summit, and they um, strengthened the, the rails and the, the ties, and then they had a six and a half mile loop that can't, actually touched to South Canaan. And uh, the year we're going to concentrate on is 1902. Um, there, there was a group of investors from Carmondale that call, called themselves the Lake Lador uh, <coughs> Company. And they were the ones that thought, wow, the railroad's going to go by there. Let's put an amusement park. And the Farview Amusement Park was extremely successful. The, it was owned entirely by the DNH. And there were times when there was 10,000 people up top of Farview Mountain just to escape from the mines, just to escape and get away from it. As somebody asked me today, uh, what's the temperature? It's a five degree temperature difference usually between here and Waymart. And that's because of the mountain. So they had an insurmountable problem. So they put this uh, loop in and they developed this park Slowly, the park up top of Fireview Mountain began to be less and less enjoyed because they didn't have a lake, see, at top of Fireview Mountain. So they had a wonderful lake called Stanton's Pond and now called Lake Lador. And someone asked me before, uh, the name Lador, if you look up a poem by Robert Southerly, it's called The Cataract of Lador. And the first two uh, Scottish engineers who came, they're the ones who named it. They're the ones who developed all the dams. And all the dams like Elk Lake, Keens Lake, White Oak Pond, Kajaw, Lador, all of them were dammed up by the DNH for the single purpose of releasing water 
when it was down in the canal so that they could bring the level of the water back up. Obviously, if the level went down, the boats would hit the bottom and they weren't going anyplace. So it was an engineering marvel. But anyway, we're going to concentrate on the park today. And um, really when I got to think about what it was like in 1902, for one thing, our President of the United States, William McKinley, had just been assassinated. And now Teddy Kennedy, Teddy Kennedy, yeah. Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt was now the president. My favorite president, by the way. Excuse me, Teddy. Anyway, he, he was very, very interested in what was happening here in Pennsylvania because of the mine problem. And it was the inkling in the beginning of the AFL-CIO. And it, it, there's an article here. I've run five copies off if any of you might be interested in it. In an article in the paper here, and uh, it was written by Rabbi Gelfin, and it, it appeared in the Tri Scranton Tribune uh, on 2001. And in here he talks about it, the reason that Lake Lador was so much a success was that it only cost a dollar to get again, number one. And most people could swing a dollar. The train ride, they would bring the trains and they would circle down there, and in my backyard is the steam station. Any, anytime you're in Weimar, 211 South Street, which is on the way up to the Salvation Army Lodge, just walk through my railroad station. It's always unlocked. And that was the steam station. And the water tower is the granite. On, and that's where my dad started his insurance agency. They removed the Cypress tank to Alfred, and it was there for 40 years. One day we drove by, my father said, what happened to the Cypress tank? And he stopped and asked the man, and he says, come here, I'll show you. And a man in Oliphant built his garage of cypress. And, of course, cypress wood was very, very, very expensive, number one, because it's one of the few woods you do not have to caulk. When it gets wet, it expands itself and seals itself. But anyway, he talks here in here, milk is eight cents a quart. Uh, the mayor of Scranton is getting in trouble in closing down the speakeasies. Of course, we know the mayor Scranton gets in trouble lots of times. A few days after Labor Day, I see that the Lyceum Theater will feature William Gill and Puddinhead Wilson by Mark Twain. The po Poly, P-O-L-I, just opened in the building that was once the Gaiety. And the Globe Warehouse announced it had silk ties for 18 cents, ladies' white petticoats for 89 cents. McCain's has men's patent leather Oxfords for sale at 98 cents, normally $3. The Goldsmith Bazaar is featuring ready-made dresses, and that was unusual, ready-made dresses. Everybody made their own. For children from 4 to 12, from 98 cents to 4.98. Anyway, he, in, in here in this article, he talks about how he... As a mine worker, I respect Mr. John Mitchell. I'm excited about hearing him. John Mitchell was only elected president of the United Mine and Workers two years ago, but he's always working for us. When he called a strike of 8,000 members of the union in 1900, 80,000 men and boys went on a strike. And it, it talks more about this, in, and it, it's in first place as if the person was, had ridden on the train. Uh, of course, a lot of other things were happening at the same time. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt had become president only because of the assassination of McKinley. And uh, the Wright brothers in 1903, you know what they did. Uh, 1902, Carrier invented air conditioning. Uh, 1906, a horrible earthquake in San Francisco. Over 3,000 died. The Tsar Nicholas still ruled Russia. Queen Victoria ruled England. And one of the nicest books was, as a librarian, retired librarian, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. And that was written in 1900. So um, there was also, the, uh, Teddy Roosevelt also used our taxpayer money. Maybe some people, we use it for all kinds of weird reasons, but he used 40 million, which is a horrible amount of money in those days. And he put in the Panama, Panama Canal. And that happened in 1902 also. And uh, there was, 
in Australia in 1902, on September the 7th, all of Australia stopped work and had a day of humbleness. And they all prayed for rain because they'd had a drought over four years and three days later it started to rain. So um, it, there's just a lot of interesting things and that's one thing that I certainly love about the computer. So we're going to take a day at the Lake Ariel Park and hopefully I know what I'm doing. Is that Lake Ariel? Lake Lador Park. And there were parks growing up all over the place. One thing that killed this park is they were doing the Luna Park in Scranton. You know, that was, that was being developed at that time. I'm going to, if you don't mind taking your cup. Oh, I just don't want to sit on it. <laughs> uh, Lake Latour attracted thousands and thousands of people who came to the D.H. Steve Station, the Honesdale Branch. And uh, mine workers, railroad workers, canal boat owners, had no labor rights, and the unions were born at sites such as Lake Lador. So anyway, they had a wonderful time, and it was a great time to get everybody together. Now if I can see what I'm doing here. This is a coal steamer ride on Lake Lador. You know, Waymart has no coal. You go over the mountain, and of course you have the Lackawanna Valley, which still has enough coal to feed all of America for 500 years, if you only were allowed to use it. And they had a coal steamer on Lake Lador. It was small. It was so small that they ordered, there were so many people that they ordered another one that was much bigger and delivered in 1911. There was no inside plumbing, no inside water. In rare cases there were. No central heat, no electricity. And it was just all being developed then. And, uh, and of course cars were just being developed, cooking by coal stove or over fireplaces, clothes were handmade, you travel by horseback, boat, or in a buggy, no paved roads, and school was only in the winter. Actually kids worked in those days, and if there was time to bring in the hay, they didn't go to school that day, they didn't have school, everybody went out and hayed. The occupations, number one occupation was farming, coal mining in the Lackawanna Valley, canal boats, were still thousands and thousands of canal boats, delivering goods by wagon and horseback, and many general stores had post offices in it. If you come into our historical society in Waymart, we had the South Canaan Post Office, and inns and taverns and hotels, and the beginning of banks and investing. There were 200 rowboats on the lake, and um, you could rent it for like 10 or 15 cents, and you could take your, your honey out in the rowboat. There was a big place there for the boats to go in for the winter time, of course, to protect them. Can I ask you a question? Sure. You said this lake was dammed up by Scottish engineers? It, That's a man-made lake? It was, yes, it was first Stanton Pond. Just like Keynes was Canoe Pond, and now it's Keynes Lake. They were all, the D&H dammed up 11, uh, number four, when you could go over Farview Mountain, number four was completely done by the D&H, number seven up top of the mountain was done, and all these places was and every day some people would let out thousands of gallons of water. Uh, everybody liked to fish. My favorite fish, Sonny's is spelled wrong, uh, catfish. My brother and I, I only live about a quarter of a mile from the lake, we used to go down and get a mess of catfish. They were delicious. But one day my brother got stung by one. I don't know if any of you guys fishing got, ever got stung by one. I noticed on uh, Channel 16 on the weekend, they were showed catching big catfish in Lake Wall and Paul Pack, and I thought, ooh, I wonder if they got it, because that hurts. And of course, you went rowing to impress your gal. That's uh, number 157. In the background, you can see just faintly uh, a tower that you could climb up and see the wonderful vista view. And St Stanton Pond became Lake Lador, and the day and age made this a feeder source for the canal. If any of you stay at the lodge, by the way, they welcome you now, the Salvation Army. It's the best deal you'll ever have. Four meal, three meals a day and a snack at night and all kinds of activities to do. 
They rebuilt the dam about f three times. They just, the uh, Lake Lador, or uh, the Salvation Army just had to spend two and a half million dollars because the DEP said that the dam was not strong enough. Well, every drop of water from Lake Lador goes into Keene's Lake. And the girls are that own Keene Lake are still fighting the DEP because they want them to rebuild their dam. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, these DNH dams were some of the strongest dams in our whole county. <coughs> this is a picture of Mrs. Soden and her sister. Mrs. Soden lives in Holmesdale, lived in Holmesdale. She's passed now. And she's looking at, uh, this was about 1912, this picture. She's looking out at the new steamer, much bigger, could take 40 to 60 people on. She's watching the people swim. And she said to me, oh, Jane, she says, my sister and I just love going to Lake Lador. But she says, we didn't like to go swimming. And I said, well, why didn't you like to go, Myrtle? And she said, well, I didn't like to go because you had to wear your swim costume. And they were made out of wool. So when she said, when you got in the water, you couldn't swim. Because you know what happens with wool. And it, she says, all of a sudden, your suit became 20 pounds. But she said, I loved swimming in the farm pond because mom, they came across by a very strange way. They came across hearing about Camp of the Wind and how it was for sale. And uh, so they, they kept it going as long as they could. But kids don't like camp as much as they used to, of course. It's not exciting enough. I have to laugh. We have 36 camps still in Wayne County. And it's amazing to see the buses going to the Viewmont Mall, to Walmart, to the movies. I, they, I don't think they go camping at all. And this was a siding. Now, this is about a half a mile from my house. Those tracks you see on the left there go directly through my house at 211 South Street and go through the present day post office in Waymart. And this was a siding where people got off and uh, started their great adventure. And this is a close up of the DNH platform and, of course, the logo. The very famous DNH logo, by the way, does not exist as of this week, I think. Isn't it, Joe? It's this week, I think, that it uh, it's no longer exists anymore. It is gone forever. Uh, this is a mother and son, not the greatest picture, but I had to add it because uh, there's very, f I, I know ladies, you all want a hat like that, I'm sure, and with her little boy, <laughs> and she's getting off the train and walking up the steps, and she's going to enjoy the park. There was, uh, of course, lots of woods, uh, and remember, the hillsides were completely denuded because everybody cut down all the trees to start their fires. And so if you see in some of these pictures, you will see that there's hardly any trees at all. But the trees were left there. The beautiful lake that was Stanton Pond and now Lake Lador, picnic tables, drinking fountains, and it said in their booklet, you don't have to, do, ladies, worry about your button shoes because they have wooden walkways and you won't have to step in the mud. And these two lovely ladies are looking for a man. Wouldn't you like to go to amusement park and have that outfit on? And it says on them, uh, where is the simp? Now, I don't know if that meant Simpson or they're looking for a man. I don't know. And see, the parks were a good place because the men all day were in the mines. And, and their little boys were in the mines. And their teenagers were in the mines. So by coming to these amusement parks, the Slovakian society, the Czechoslovakian society, the, uh, uh, any society you ever heard of would have these excursions. And it was a good chance to meet other people in your ethnic group. And lo and behold, sometimes they met people in other ethnic groups, which wasn't always welcome. <laughs> this is a, a drinking fountain. They just, they, it was such a big drinking fountain. It was there for years and years that the kids loved to splash in it. Now what do they have? Splash parks. They have splash parks every place, way ahead of their time. And of course, the baseball was the all-American sport. As I said, up top of Farview Mountain, there were times when there's 10,000 people. And when you consider they all came by Gravity Railroad, 
or horse and buggy or horseback. And now they came on the train mostly. And lots of times it was Lackawanna County teams against Wayne County teams. And uh, if you're acquainted with Lake Lador now, uh, when you go on the campsite, just as you start to go down the hill, as if you're going into the camp, that's where this field is. And then just as like you're going down to the Fine Arts Center where the Senior Expo is going to be held next <laughs> month. Uh, up there at the top, you can see a glimpse of the lake on the right. There was a Lake Lador Lodge. Sometime if you had a little extra money and you could take your family, maybe you'd stay two or three nights. And then you would swim in the lake and, and you would go on all the little rides. And it was a real excursion. And you know, out to Beach Lake, there's all those boarding houses. And this is the same thing. It was a boarding house for people to get away from the dirt of the city and the dirt of the mines and the hard, hard labor that all of them were experiencing in that time. Is that still No, that is gone. There's only one building left. That's the carousel building. This was burnt down about five years ago and I stood there and cried. It was, uh, the, this was the recreation center. And my dad said that what he loved about it, Guy Lombardo played there and other people like that, he, what he loved was that it had a walkway above it. And you walked around the walkway and you could look down at everybody dancing. And he said that was just so wonderful. Again, you see, the, you see lots of benches, you see lots of tables and a wooden walkway. That's the recreation and, da and dance pavilion. They was, it was just so famous. They had almost all the uh, bands of that day were here usually one night and then they usually were in Neog Park for one night and they make the circuit and work their way down to wilkes -Barre and Beak. And so and this is what they looked like in the 50s when it was Camp of the Wind. See the promenade? It goes all the way around the building so you could walk around the building and see what was going on. Uh, in those days when it was Camp of the Wind, uh, you were, had units and you had war games, which I suppose you can't even mention today. They probably call them love games now. Well, maybe that's not that either. And anyway, they would, that was a lot of fun. That, the last week at camp, we had all kinds of games and it was the biggest fun of all. This boathouse uh, uh, becomes a recreation center. It, uh, in the 1950s, it was a recreation center. They, of course, they had to have the boathouse the, the small steamer was sold to Newton Lake. The large steamer rotted away, and eventually, after about 30 years, it sunk to the bottom, and a friends of mine that were dredging the lake, remember, because it was a pond, turned into a lake, so every once in a while it has to be dredged. It was dredged two years ago, uh, the upper part of the lake again. And uh, they, they used this for different purposes, but mostly, it became a rec hall for rainy days and so forth like that. Uh, the dining room pavilion is gone also. It was a beautiful building. It uh, stood halfway up in the bank, halfway up uh, from the road, from the camp down uh, to the lake. And uh, it was a, a very, they could see 200 people and feed them. And uh, lots of times that these different ethnic groups would come on the train and on the train one time in, in 1902 also, there were 2,000 Russians that came over on the train from, and they started in Scranton, and of course they hit uh, Oliphant and Archbald and all the places all the way up. And they came and they went all the way to the curve that touches South Canaan. They got off the train, they had two wonderful, wonderful murals. Uh, icons really and the she who doesn't who hears everything was a one of them and if you go into St. Ticons that is that mural that was brought in 1902 that icon is in the front of the church so the two icons were brought there they got off the train and they walked the two and a half miles to the Wagner farm which the Russian church had bought at that time the Orthodox Church and that's how St. Ticons started uh, there were 30 monks they stayed behind and stayed in the 
uh, farmhouse and they built St. Tecon's Church and they built a lot of other things there also. So all these different ethnic groups, especially from Eastern Europe that were working in the mines, working on the railroads, uh, many of them ended up at least coming one or two, uh, half a dozen times to Lake Lador. This was a, a, a postcard showing you the steamer at Lake Lador. And the little steamer is by the big steamer. Can you see the two distinct difference? And of course, uh, there is, um, uh, on the lake there is a number of rowboats also. <coughs> we see people lining up for your turn on the steamer. It was a great, great attraction. Everybody told everybody when they came home, I had a ride on the steamer. It was the biggest deal of all. Uh, nowadays, if you're not upside down, sideways, upside down uh, on a, a roller coaster, your day isn't made. Um, notice the clothes that people wore in those days. Uh, the long, long dresses, the arms covered. Boy, ladies, are we lucky today. <laughs> and another view of the steamer along the lake. Uh, of course, they had wonderful Fourth of July celebrations and all kinds of uh, things for people to enjoy at the lake for the day or as long as you wanted to stay. A rowboat ride is fun also. And so sometimes my dad said when he went down there, the 200 rowboats would be all out and you had to make a reservation for a rowboat when it came in. Sometimes you had to wait a couple hours before you could get a rowboat. Nowadays they don't want, they want an engine and they want to ride on the back of what do they call those things that go 100 miles an hour uh, on the lake. Watch your step little boy with those high button shoes. See these high button shoes? He's carefully getting into the boat or he's holding onto the boat. And uh, again we see the steamer crowded in the background there. And we see it coming up to the dock. And uh, again, they, they did as many rides as they could, but they went around the whole pond. It's 240 acres. It's a big lake now. And uh, people loved going down to the dam, especially. So it was a wonderful trip to go all the way around the lake. And the rowboats, the steamer, the carousel, you see on the right there, a little bit of the carousel. That is a dining room for the camp today. The boathouse and the dock. You see all those different things, all that activity going on. It was a wonderful, wonderful time. Somebody colorized that picture? Yes, that's a, a colorized picture. In those days, they'd take a picture and they'd send it to New York or Philadelphia. Somebody would colorize it. And that's why you don't know if, if the roof was really red. You, you expect the water was probably blue, but probably not that blue. Uh, so lots of times, I have to laugh at our church in Weimar some of the colorized pictures of it because it, 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 they added all these colors to it that I'm sure never existed. Uh, they also had a roller coaster. It, it was not, amazingly, it wasn't as well received as the one at Nayog Park. That one was very well received. Uh, it only lasted the last few years. They added it reluctantly to the park. So it wasn't put into like 1911 or 12. So it really didn't last that very, very long. But uh, of course, roller coasters nowadays don't eat before you get on them. <laughs> a park, of course, must have a Ferris wheel. And look at that lady there. Now there were christenings sometimes held at the lake and baptisms. Uh, and sometimes an ethnic group would have a whole family come and they'd all go into the water and have some sort of ceremony. Gentlemen, of course, all wore uh, suits and, of course, a hat. And look at that beautiful gown and that lady holding her baby. It's just, a, I wished I had a picture of her from the front. I'd love to see what she looked like. And these two brave ladies, they're sitting there. Look at, she's got her uh, crop in her hand. So she probably came by horseback. And she looks like she has a the kind of skirt that women wore, the split skirts, they would call them split skirts. And those days, look at their hair, girls. Now that is a curl of all curls. And, uh, and nowadays, of course, uh, 
the, the rules and regulations of today, they would never allow you to ride on something that just a couple pieces of iron were holding you up. Walking around the lake, you could walk all the way around the lake. Even now today, you can still walk around the lake. There's only one, one place left that Lake Lador doesn't own, but you still can walk around the lake. And uh, when the savages die, then that is going to go to the Salvation Army and they'll own not only the lake, but everything around it. You see the carousel to the left, just the corner of it. The biggest problem at the lake, of course, is invasive species. Like everybody says, oh, isn't that gorgeous, that loose strife down that's blooming, that's purple, the tall purple. That is a, an invasive species and it pushes out our species. So lots of times they uh, put copper, copper sulfide in the water to kill a lot of the vegetation. Uh, the boathouse and the carousel building, a beautiful picture of the carousel building. It was built by a gentleman in Weimar who owned the Weimar Hotel, not the Weimar Hotel of today, but the one down by where the post office is. And he, his name was Hans Holtznagel. And he was a German. And in Holtznagel in German means straight nail. And if you go into the carousel building and look up at the ceiling, it's just positively gorgeous. And he built it specifically for the carousel. All the horses were hand carved in Bavaria and brought here and assembled here. So he had the sizes and everything. And so he, he built it and then it was ready to receive the carousel when it, rove, when it arrived. And of course they put it together then. Uh, look at the boys. Uh, of course they wore knickers and they also wore uh, button shoes. Uh, nowadays we're happy if they have a couple little handkerchiefs over themselves. And they're shooting the chutes into the lake. That was much too dangerous for little kids. And of course the little kids would sit there thinking, oh man, I'd love to do that. There was a lake up by where the uh, entrances to uh, the, the camp. And that lake, they would, you'd go up there, you'd walk up there, you'd get on this and they'd release water and you'd shoot the chute right down to the lake. And it was, it was an exciting ride for those days. And now, it meant like I've gone to Hershey Park a couple times, the log ride is the same concept, exactly the same concept. The water takes you down and you're sitting in something that looks like a log. This little girl sitting over at the side there, I know she's just wishing she was on that ride, though especially when it splashed and hit the lake. Oh, what a feeling, and everybody screamed. What a wonderful, wonderful feeling that was. And somebody asked me, well, what's the rope for? That's the rope. If it gets away and starts to drift out into the lake, they're able to catch it and, and bring it back. This little engine was, of course, for little people. But my dad said he rode on it probably 100 times. The little engine, when they closed the park, was sold to Nayog Park. And for many years, my dad would take my brother and I down, and he'd say, when I was your age, I rode on that train, and now the train was sold and it's in Florida. And the last mayor, remember he swore that he was gonna bring the train back? Yeah. And he didn't do it, and it made me so sad. I was hoping that the train would come back. So if I ever win the lottery, you know that I'm gonna go right to Florida and buy that train. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there was a small, tiny merry-go-round out for the little children and the young at heart because merry-go-rounds were by far the carousel music. Uh, the, it, people just loved, loved merry-go-rounds. It was one of the favorite things at any park. And I think this woman is not very happy she's having her picture taken, but anyway. And the straw hats men, oh, my dad had a wonderful straw hat. And they had a penny arcade. They were seeing it's right next to the, the hall where the carousel horses are. I only had some pictures of the carousel horses. All these pictures were given to me by people who their mothers, grandmothers, great-grandmothers had, they came, the pictures that people throw out, please, if you come across any pictures, give them to me. I'll be glad to scan them in and I'll be glad to give them back to you. But this is how I got all the pictures, by putting an article in the paper and asking people 
if they would give us some pictures. Notice there, that's a penny arcade. You threw things into a bottle, just like they do today. And they were very, very up to date because you see there's a black man, African American, sitting there also. So they would come in for the summer, they'd work for the summer, there'd be a summer job at the amusement park. And they had sideshows. The amazing little horses, nowadays we call them miniature horses. Lots of people raise miniature horses. And of course they all had to have a scary place to go and walk through the haunted house. And uh, it was just a favorite. Unfortunately, most people in those days were so dressed up and had such dark clothing on, only the ones that really had white dresses on were cool. In the wintertime, between Lake Lador and Keens Lake was a huge, huge, huge ice house. And the D&H had a spur there to the ice house. And all winter long, you, people would come and cut the ice and then it was sent out by train to New York City or to Philadelphia. And of course everybody had an ice box in those days. And what did they put between ice so it, would, it wouldn't melt? Sawdust. Sawdust, right. That was the number one thing. Notice the hillside. It's almost completely denuded of, of uh, trees. And so on this siding they would send out whole uh, car loads of them. In the meantime, they would store them in this huge, huge building. And uh, they would, and my father said that he and his dad would always go down for one week. All the men in Waymart would go down for a week. And if they gave him a week of work, then they could have 100 pounds of ice every week for the summer. For, so it was a, a barter type thing. They weren't paid. They were, uh, they kept uh, books and they kept how many days they worked and how many uh, pieces of ice that they could have. And of course they were delivered on big ice wagons. There were thousands and thousands and thousands of blocks of ice and they were stored there and that happened all over the place, not just between Lador and Keynes. They had a huge, huge, huge one uh, out in, um, oh gosh, where's that railroad? Ah, it just slipped my mind. It'll come to me. But there were, uh, Goolsboro, there had a huge ice house there, the biggest one in the whole county. And every man worked for ice for his family ice box. And uh, it was cold, wet work, but you did it because you wanted to have it for next summer. And you had to carefully put the ice on a lift, and they had, he, my dad said, that they had a lift and it was, nowadays you wouldn't be allowed to do it, but it was horse driven and it would pull the blocks of ice into the ice house. During World War I, when uh, my aunt died in World War I, she died at Toby Hanna, she and 2,000 other people, she graduated from nursing school at Hahnemann and Wilkes-Barre and a week later she was dead because she went to attend the soldiers and so when they combated that one way they combated it was that they sent they set up all these training places at camps all over the United States and so for a couple years they had a training place there at Lake Lador and another picture of the troop formation and uh, seeing uh, sending Lake Lador to others remember postcards at the beginning you wrote on the side where the picture was. It was only in later years that you were allowed to write on the back of it. Um, and uh, she died from the Asiatic flu. It was uh, millions of people died from the Asiatic flu, and uh, and she caught. She was at Toby Hanna, and they don't have a monument or anything up there, which bothers me. And two thousand men and nurses died there before they were sent out to World War I, died at uh, Toby Hanna, yes. That was a huge troop transport place and training ground, what huge, year huge. Was that? Uh, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 
She was 20 years old and had just graduated from uh, nursing school. She called up her mother and father and told them that if they wanted to see her, to come up to Tobihana and she could sit on the other side of the room to say goodbye to them because she saw her fingers were turning blue. See, that, that's what the Asiatic flu did. It covered your lungs and vi finally you choked to death because you couldn't get any air and you're, so slowly cyanosis would set into all your limbs. So, so they did want to go up and say, they said goodbye to her and then when she died, uh, they put her in the front room and people walked by outside to see her. Um, and on this, uh, it says, this is 1911, the new steamer at Lador, underneath the name there in New Jersey. Uh, the steamer at Lador is a dandy. And there are vast or wonderful improvements. So they're always trying to improve it. And this was the brochure the DNH put out for excursions and the excursion rates and a picture of course of the of the lake. Up top of that mountain is where the lodge is now and that's the street I live on, South Street in the borough. So that's on the other side of the lake from the camp. And of course everybody has to take home a memory and you see sitting on the table some of the souvenirs from Lake Lador. I hope and pray that someday that this comes to us so that we have it in our society. And uh, we do have a little hatchet that we did get. And, uh, and of course, even in those days, what they call that, not ice cake, uh, cheesecake. cheesecake. Cheesecake, they had to try to get some other people to come. So those bathing beauties were encouraging to come to Lake Lador. And it is L-O-D-O-R-E. And it got published wrong in the Scranton paper, L-A-D-R-E, and from that point on, it was L-A-D-R-O-R-E. And that, uh, it, we, we have traced it back to that newspaper, and we don't know how it happened besides that, or somebody just didn't know how to spell. And so the memories are like uh, uh, Lake Lador, and, and now the Salvation Army, and they're keeping it pristine and beautiful. And... Uh, we thank the people who gave it to us. And again, if you know of any photos of Lake Lador, I appreciate to add it to this. And of course, thank you to my late dad, Willard Varco, for instilling his love of Lake Lador, Lador in me. And I did love it, and I still love it today. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. And it, um, if there's any questions, I'm glad to to hear. Uh, uh, my grandmother with 10 times, says Lake Lador 1915. I don't have it here, but oh. I'll take it off. Oh, I'd love to have a yes. picture of it. Here, and the Sears already found one picture. So uh, anyway, it, uh, they grew up all over the place. When they, uh, the Lunar Park in Scranton was the death kill of Lador too.